Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Teacher Talk with Doc Rocker. I, as always, am your host, is Russ Downey, and with me today, as always, is Danton Arlotto of Doc Rocker Music. Hey. And welcome to the first episode of our new series here on Teacher Talk with Doc Rocker, Teacher Talk Tutelage, where we break down various general music topics for fellow music educators and students alike. So, Danton, for our first episode of Teacher Talk Tutelage, which I'm just loving the alliteration, <laughs> what are we talking about for today? I can't wait to see when the channel eventually grows and just how many crazy alliterations. You could tell we like the letter T. So today, we figured for the first episode, we wanted to cover something really, really broad in general. We're going to talk about the circle of fifths, which, as any educator out there knows, is one of those just overarching crucial topics that you just eventually have to slay through with your with your with your students so we're, we're going to find ways to break down different resources um and as russ mentioned we're going to try to make it as accessible for and anybody out there on the internet who's looking to learn more about the circle of fifths this can be a very useful resource for them as well so let's get right into it what is the circle of fifths what is the circle of fifths I feel like I'm on Jeopardy. No. Um, <laughs> so the best way I can explain is the circle of fifths is a way of organizing the 12 chromatic pitches uh, by intervals of a perfect fifth. So by perfect fifth, we're talking about um, basically five notes apart. So like notes like C to G or D to A, E to B, F to C, basically that way. And it works uh, both forwards and backwards as well. All the examples I gave were uh, basically ascending or moving upwards, but you can go backwards. You can go from C down to F or B down to E, uh, A down to D, and it just kind of continues in that fashion. And the circle of fifths is really versatile in that it allows you both to move upwards and downwards as well. So I figure what we would do is the first thing we would talk about besides just the definition of it is actually to take a look at an example of what the circle of fifths looks like, kind of talk about how it's organized, how to read it, and what it basically the kind of resources it offers for you being able to figure out your key signatures and everything else you need it for. So as you can see here, we have an example of the circle of fifths for all the major keys. And Danton, would you like to give a brief overview of what we're looking at here and how to read it? Yeah, so um, just to, to, to clear the air a little bit, the circle of fifths can also be referred to as the circle of keys. And we use the circle of fifths primarily for the construction of what are, what's called the major scale, which we'll get into that towards the end of the session today. But um, people also sometimes refer to it as the circle of fourths which can be a little confusing because if you do the math counting from the letter C to the letter F, if you go upwards, it makes a fourth, but every interval has an inverse. So we're gonna try to keep things really simple and only talk about it as fifths. So in the case of C to F, going down five steps instead of up four. So what happens when you construct your different scales going through your circle of fifths, each individual note, C, G, D, A, E, B, and so on, get then gets a unique construction of a major scale so this all these guys in this pink bubble here lay out what are the unique sets of sharps and flats for each and every major key of course as given in the circle all organized by fifth all right and basically like danson said it gives you basically every key signature for each of your keys just as a note uh, if you're not sure what a key signature is key signature basically tells you what the pitches are going to be for a given scale whether they be a certain number of sharps or flats or none at all in the case of c major but basically what we're looking at here is a tool that basically shows you each of those keys for every single major key you could think of or have a song uh that you would play in minus some more um unusual tonalities to say the least. But basically the circle of fifths is a great resource for being able to figure out how you're going to go about playing a certain song and certain key signatures, and also to help figure out what those sharps are and what those flats are so you know what those key signatures are telling you. Now, besides the fact that it actually shows you on the, uh, the grand staff on each of those particular keys there, there's also an order of sharps and order of flats to talk about. So Danton, that was, I know that was one thing we were going to talk about. And I know every teacher kind of has their own, uh, their own little mnemonic device that they use for remembering the order of sharps and the order of flats. But just as a reference, the way it goes is that the order of sharps is F, C, G, D, A, E, and B. And the order of flats is the reverse, B, E, A, D, G, C, and F. 
Now, Denton, I know you. Uh, I know you have some mnemonic devices you prefer when it comes time for helping students to uh, to remember the order of sharps and flats. So, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd like to save that for the end because I, w when I share, I, I have a little worksheet that I got from one of my teachers when I was growing up, and then I've kind of repurposed it to use for all of my students. And th th there's a whole process, and then we kind of uncover sharp by sharp and flat by flat. So I, I, I'm going to do like a little kind of speed run through that same worksheet, and then share links to that. On, on our Facebook group page so that people can download it and use it if they want, if they find it useful in their teaching. Um, so yeah, I'll save that for the end. Uh, but just to establish it, like I said, the order of sharps is F, C, G, D, A, E, and B. And myself personally, one of the mnemonic devices that I learned for it uh, was fat cats go down alleys eating burritos, which always gets a bit of a chuckle from students, which I, I always find entertaining. Um, but it's a good way to remember it because I find if they, you know, if your students, you know, tend to laugh at the statement a little bit, they usually tend to remember it a little bit more than something that's a little bit more plain. Yeah, unfortunately, sure, sure. it's great to reinforce memorization. It's a great exactly. Topic. And you know, for the sharp side, it's that one makes it a bit easier to remember. For the flat side, there aren't quite as many great ones for that, at least that I've found. But one of the main ones that stuck with me was bead greatest common factor. It's much quicker. It's not as many words. Uh, but it gives you all the information you need right there. Yeah, so, quick and easy to memorize for kids. That, that, that was the one that I learned growing up. That always stuck with me. Gotcha. So one other thing we did want to talk about with the circle of fifths as well, besides how to interpret it and how to read it, is resources that go along with how to teach it to your students. And you know, one of the things that can be difficult is basically putting this up in front of a student and being able to make it easy to understand because the first time looking at something like this, and it can look kind of daunting to a student who's just learning about key signatures for the first time. And you, know, you usually have to wind up explaining, well, this is how you read this, but then you can also read all these others and here's all the other key signatures. And next thing you know, it's kind of like information overload a little bit. Yeah. So Danton, I know you have a way that you like to uh, go ahead and at least teach how to figure out uh, different major scales from the circle of fifths that kind of demystifies the concept of reading this. So did you want to go ahead and talk about that? Yeah, yeah. So let's switch over. I, I will share my screen instead. Uh, I actually have, um, I, 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 like I said, I, I got this from one of my teachers uh, when I was studying privately in high school, and it just really stuck with me. And I, like I said, in, 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 the, in the, the modern era of Zoom lessons and online teaching, I've repurposed it into a, into a reusable blank Word document that I now use and I go through it, you know, in a screen share with my students in their lessons. So I'll do kind of like a mock display of what that's going to be. Um, and then I'll link the, the, the blank Word doc. Like I said, I'll share it onto the, the, the Teacher Talk with Doc Rocker Facebook group page. So here it is. Um, if you guys could see that, let's see. All right. So for me to to teach the circle of fifths is synonymous with to teach the major scale itself, since they're they're so directly connected. So um, depending on the student, how advanced they are and how much prior experience with learning scales and keys they have, um, I may even make all this content completely blank where I even take the definition away. But basically, to, to simply define a major scale, uh, I like to put it as a repeating series of seven notes in alphabetical order. Uh, what I mean by that is each and every scale uses all seven letters of the musical alphabet for exactly one pitch. Once you get to your eighth note, which is what you, what you usually do when you're playing your scales, we count the eighth note as the first one again which is where the term octave becomes very important because it's the same scale degree. And that's a whole different talk for another different day. But yeah, so I have a student go through that definition, you know, and we usually start with the C major scale, which is the simplest since it has no sharps or flats. And we go through and we, we, we you know, we, we discuss how the, the letters are organized in alphabetical order. You know, we're not skipping any letters. We're not using any one letter for two different notes. And, and I always make it a point to reinforce to a student that that's an important thing to remember. Because as we go through more keys and we start stacking in lots of sharps and flats, it can be real easy to misspell them. And I've seen plenty of resources in my day teaching that are incorrect. Um, so I, I like to have this nice, like real, real, real deal breakdown here. So depend, again, depending on the student, we could also talk a little bit about how the scale is constructed using this thing called a tetrachord, which is basically from any starting pitch, a series of one whole step, one whole step, one half step. And then we talk about how a major scale just 
marries two tetrachords in the middle with a whole step, which is where we get into a uh, dominant function. And that ties right back into the whole circle of fifths thing in the first place of, uh, okay, so we, we spell out our C scale. And I always have this one listed as a given. And then we determine that, okay, this little star guy here is G. So G is the fifth degree of C. And that's the key we go to next. And we go through and we spell out a G scale. Um, and then we talk about how since they're a fifth apart, they're closely related. And what we mean by that is, again, the easiest way I like to fill this in with students is I just tell them, give me the letters from G to G in alphabetical order as fast as you can. And, you know, a G and then A and then B and C and D and E and F and then G. And then I have them play. Usually I do this with piano, mostly more than any other instrument. So I'll have them play that scale and then they'll notice right away ah, something sounds a little funky. And then we OK, well, let's check our steps using this little chart and we realize, OK, well, well, E to F should be a whole step, and that's where the F sharp comes in to make the G major scale sound exactly like the C major scale did. Um, and then we keep track. I have a nice little catalog we keep down here, so I'll add F to the bucket, and then we keep going. And we rinse repeat for each and every key. And then I also explain that, okay, now since G was closely related to C, so will the key of D relate to the key of G. So I have them right in the D scale, carry over the F sharp that we already found from G. And then we only have to figure out one unique sharp, which then becomes, and then usually by the time we get, sometimes as far as, as early as like the third key, uh, some of my brighter students will notice, hey, I'm noticing that the, the that that the new sharp is always the seventh step of the scale. And then that makes it even easier to finish filling the whole thing in. And then if we do it, if we do it all right, we come full circle, we get back to the letter C where we started. Only now every single note is sharp, including the E sharp, which always makes a piano student turn a funny look. <laughs> but but I explain that, you know, OK, so and there's a reason that we spell it as E sharp. And again, it comes back to our definition, that nice, clean alphabetical rotation, which I always like to say it's like, oh, it makes you sound really smart, you know, alphabetical and rotation. And I like that a lot, too, because I, I've had, you know, students uh, on occasion try and spell a scale out like this, where let's say it was C sharp major uh, they have for something and they might try and spell it with like F natural and then F sharp. And I'm like. Well, hold on a minute. Yeah, you, know, you got to remember, you have to use every single, you know, pitch yeah. letter. It's mm -hmm. not like, you know, even though it's enharmonically correct, it's not, it's not the correct usage, if you will. And yeah. I think that's a really important thing to make clear is that for a major scale, everything is basically using one pitch letter in alphabetical order, and then just adjust it accordingly. And yeah, I think that's really a really clear way to make that work. And it's just a clear rule that everybody can understand. Yeah, and I like to just put it here in plain letters in a big box diagram. We're not even using a music staff, so we're not. it's not even contingent on any student's ability to read the grand staff or anything like that. It's just here it is spelled out in plain big old capital letters. And once we go through the full lesson, we have every major scale spelled out correctly. Um, and that's important for a lot of reasons. And um, fellow music educators will already know some of this information and understand why that's important and how the circle of fifths is really such a such a such such an important foundation for a student's further advanced development when we talk about chord construction and intervals and all that sort of thing where like okay yeah we need to know that c to e is always a third and when are the differences of when it's a major third or a minor third or in the really rare cases things like augmented uh, aug augmented and diminished thirds which <laughs> exist but they're super super rare um but yeah. Um, anyway, so yeah, and then we rinse repeat and then I, I put a nice little break in the middle here and it's like, all right, well, let's start back at C. And now instead of going up by fifth, let's go down by fifth. And that's how we'll find all our flat keys. So we rinse repeat. We do the same exact thing. Okay, the key of F is closely related to the key of C, but one note is out of place. Oops, I'm going a little too fast here. Uh, B, C, D, E. You know, and then I'll, I will I will determine with the student that, OK, well, we, or right away, that first tetrachord is wrong because A to B needs to be a half step. So we flat the B, we add that, and then there we go. Rinse, repeat the entire conversation we just had. We spell it to fill in all the flat keys. Um, once the complete diagram is finished, usually one lesson, um, if, if I have like a shorter lesson or I, I spend a little more time talking about it with the student, we'll do like all the sharp keys first, and then I'll save it and we'll reset and do all the flats the next lesson. Sometimes I have to break it down depending on time constraints and things like that. But once they finish the entire thing, then we talk about this. 
how the final three keys all overlap and are enharmonically equivalent. So, um, which is funny because we think of only 12 chromatic keys, but when you lay out the circle of fifths in this way, including your five, six, and seven sharps, your five, six, and seven flats, you actually get a grand total of 15 different keys. And even though the G flat major scale has all the same pitches in it as the F sharp scale, it is a different key. Right. Um, and I like the diagrams, like the one that Russell showed earlier, where it shows the overlap, but it still writes out, like, okay, this is the key of B, and then it can be respelled as the key of C flat. And I explained to students that there are rare cases where you would want to use the one that's got more flats over the lesser sharps for different reasons, usually for pieces that modulate. If you're right. already in a key with a lot of flats, it just makes more sense to keep keep flats and just spell it that way. Um, and especially to understand that such thing as a C flat major chord exists and that it can happen and don't be scared of it. So we go through the entire thing. And again, as we do all the flats, I do my nice little, I fill in the flats as we go here and I put all the letters in. And then the mnemonic that I really like to teach, I learned this in, in my high school advanced music theory class. Um, and it, it stuck with me because when I realized what it was and how it worked, it blew my mind. And I, at that moment in my life, I swore I would never use another mnemonic. The one I like to use, and I explain it on the sharp side first, since we usually start with sharps, is Father Charles goes down and ends a battle. And any of you other fellow teachers out there that have used this one know, know precisely why I like it so much, because if you read it backwards, you get battle ends and down goes Charles' father, um, which makes sense. It's a logical statement in both directions. And that further solidifies the main point that I like to make with my students, especially that you want to stick with everything just being fifths. You know, Try not to confuse yourself with a circle of fourths because C to F can be considered a fourth. I, 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 I always joke with my students, you know, if you ever have a teacher that tells you there's a circle of fourths, you have my permission to dispute that and say, no, there is no such thing as a circle of fourths. Um, it definitely, in, in terms of music theory, makes a lot more sense to keep everything to fifths and especially the sharp side just going clockwise and the flat side just going counterclockwise. But it's always the same distance. It's always the same relationship of the letters alphabetically, distance wise. Uh, and just as a nice little bonus for kids, I, I keep the sixth degree highlighted so that they can just as easily use this chart in future lessons to find all of the minor keys as well by key signature. Uh, and that's it. You know, th 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 this is the way that I've been doing it for years. I really like this system. Naturally, when I do lessons in person, I do, uh, yeah, I, I take out an old piece of notebook paper and we do it the old fashioned way and I draw out the boxes and, and myself and the student fill in the charts together. And by the time they do it, they, they have such a greater understanding of all 15 major keys. And that helps them when they're learning their scales. It helps them when they're learning how the keys relate. It helps them learn why uh, going from a C chord to a G chord sounds really nice, but going from a C to an F sharp chord sounds really weird. It answers a lot of questions that students have about it an unlistable amount of different topics you know like i said key relations chord construction um modulation um it, it transcends style you know this is just as useful for your classically trained students as it is for your rock and pop kids it's just as useful for your instrumentalists as it is for your kids that are just looking for some help getting a better grade in their in their music theory classes in school or in college you know I've, I've done this with adults i've done it with college kids i've done it with younger younger kids i think the youngest student i've ever done this with was maybe only eight or nine and and, and they picked wow. it up you know and then they had they have a really good understanding of all the major keys um well i think the one thing that's really nice about this one and i know you've explained this uh this method to me a while back before i really like the fact that like it allows the student to have that aha moment about what the actual relationship is between the fifths from the circle without even showing the circle first it basically lays out all the information before you even talk about the actual you know the actual circle of fifths itself um which is good because that basically means when they go to it and see it, you're basically just seeing what the resource is and basically mapping that from that uh, from that page onto the actual circle itself which i think makes it easier to interpret because there is a learning curve the first time you see it if you're not prepped for it yeah which is why i usually like to save it for 
you know, after a student's already had a pretty sizable amount of experience, you know, they could already play a, a couple different keys, a couple different scales. Um, and I usually save it for kind of like a when the time comes kind of thing. You know, like I, I just had a student really recently who who has a pretty solid background. You know, she's maybe like a level two, level three piano player now. And she um, and she wanted to pick up some particular pop song that was just in the gross key of G flat. And that was that was the doorway. And it's like, all right, well, let's get into the circle of fifths and let, let, let's help you be able to navigate that scary key and understand that it's really not so different than G just has a lot more flats in it and That's not exactly the sharp, right. obviously. Yeah. So, so for, for me, it varies. A student could be doing it for, you know, anywhere from like already two or three years into lessons. Mm -hmm. If they come in at a more advanced level already, I sometimes do this first, like right away during their trial period. Like let's do the circle of fifths and hammer it all out because we will always come back to it in future lessons to answer lots of questions that you'll ever have about anything. Really. It's one of those, like I said, in the beginning of today's session, I can't emphasize enough of how important this concept is to have really clear with your students. I Absolutely. Think so. And the funny part is that um, when I first learned about the Circle of Fifths, there was a particular resource that a teacher of mine, who was a uh, music theory teacher in my high school, uh, taught us that was basically a very condensed version of the Circle of Fifths that actually, I, I feel myself personally works better for being able to see your order of sharps and flats and figure them out. Um, than the actual regular circle itself, which I kind of found surprising, but I find myself thinking through that as a shorthand versus actually using the, the regular one itself. And I'm actually going to put that up on the screen so we can take a look. Yeah, let's, look at that. let's see here. So this is basically a simplified version of the circle of fifths. You'll notice, though, we don't have any more enharmonic uh, keys down here at the bottom. And we've really just reduced it to our seven pitches by fifths. And Here's the way you interpret this. Basically, it starts the way the normal circle of fifths does. C is up at the top uh, with no sharps, no flats. All the sharp keys, the sharps go in this direction and the flat keys go in this direction. And you may notice there's this dividing line over here. So the way this dividing line works is that this is both uh, how you tell what you name the scale, whether it has a sharp or a flat in the title of it, and where you start the counting of your sharps and flats. So let me give you an example here. Uh, let's say I'm going to be trying to find out the key signature for D major. So I start here at C, which is zero, go to G, that's one. And I go to D, that's two. And since we're going around the sharp side, I have zero, one, two sharps. Now, I continue going clockwise for the sharp direction and I start from this line to figure out my sharps. One sharp with F, two sharps with C. So fairly straightforward with that, but let's try one that uh, winds up having to actually change the name of the scale itself on the flat side. So let's say I wanted to figure out, well, let's see if I'm going in the flat direction, let's try E. And since I got past this line, now that's no longer B and E, it's B flat and E flat and A flat and D flat and G flat and so on and so forth. So start here at zero for C and one flat, two flat, three flats. That means E flat has three flats in the key signature. And I start from this line and continue counterclockwise because that's the direction of the flats. And I have B flat, E flat, and A flat. And the funny part is I found this being a shorthand that was really helpful for being able to figure out my key signatures on the fly rather than having to refer back to the circle of fifths itself, the full version. And it doesn't necessarily um, kind of give you the whole aha moment that the chart that you showed before, uh, you know, gives you, this is more like a shorthand resource that can help you to quickly figure out what uh, the number of sharps or flats is for a given key, and then to figure out what the sharps or flats are for that particular key. And so I, I've used this in the past and I find it's helpful because it, it, it works very quickly and that's its main strength. Yeah, I, I really like this. I've never seen like a simplified breakdown of it like this. And, and and this is great, especially for a student who's already gone through and done like the whole ringer of learning all the keys. This is like one of those nice quick ways that they can really, you know, quickly call back on that. I love the simplicity of that dividing line that also shows you the order of the sharps and the order of the flats and tells you when your keys start on sharp or flat notes. I love it. That's great. It's very, very simple. Yeah, and the funny part is that this is one of those things where I found myself when I was in theory classes, I would just jot this down on the top of the test and I would use it for the entire test. It was really quick and simple to remember how to write down and draw. And it was, I, I can't tell you, it was an immeasurable number of times that I used this to help myself as I was learning. 
And it was really helpful just to keep track of it in my brain until it became second nature. So I recommend this one as a uh, shorthand for any students out there learning theory uh, or for anybody who needs a way to remember the circle of fifths. I found it helped me a lot and I'm sure it can help people as well. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. And, and you know, that kind of brings me to the last point here is that, you know, as music educators, there's a ton of different ways that we find ways to teach these subjects to our students. And for the students out there, there's a multitude of different ways and different variations that you'll find that somebody can explain this to you. All kind of arriving at the same point, just coming from different angles or different approaches, starting from a different part or from a different place. And we always like to hear uh, what other music teachers and other, uh, you know, what music students are using as resources because our goal is to create a community of information or a community with information that music educators and students alike can use to learn or to teach these subjects. So for anybody out there who has any examples of what they use to teach the circle of fifths or uh, related to the circle of fifths and your keys or key signatures, we absolutely would love to hear them from you. Um, we encourage people to go ahead and post them on the Teacher Talk with Doc Rocker Facebook group page. Uh, there's always, always a, uh, a great, great want for us to see how everybody is out there teaching these subjects and to see what makes it even more understandable to those who are learning. Our goal as music educators isn't just to teach, but to, you know, to make it easily understandable for those who want to learn how to play, basically to try and demystify it as much as possible so that more people, you know, feel that ease of wanting to get into learning how to play or how to, how to read or how to, you know, how just to take their play any further them. once they already can play some basics. Exactly. And that's our goal as music educators. So we encourage anybody who has any uh, ways they'd like to teach to please share them with us. Feel free. Absolutely. So Dan, any, uh, any final thoughts on today's topic for those that are watching? Um, nothing aside from what's already been said. You know, the whole point of this is that we want these videos to bring value to like, like students and teachers alike, you know, so we hope it brings value to your continued music learning for all you uh, aspiring music students out there. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel, Pansy Podcast Productions, for more music tutorial content. Um, thanks so much for watching. Uh, this is our first video, uh, hopefully many more to come. So stay tuned for more teacher talk tutelage.